so welcome. Thank you. And I know that you're on a busy schedule because since the presidential election, we've been talking backstage and this man is busy and he's going from place to place and there's, I hope there's a plan. We want your answer on that later. But can I start by taking you back? Because I, I know you're a San Francisco boy and I think you would have been about 20 when the summer of love happened in 1967 and it was that time of big social change. Um, and I gather you were involved in a strike um, to set up a Department of Black Studies at university, even yeah. then. Was activism always in your blood? I, I think so. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, I, I was just fortunate enough uh, to find theater at some point and figured that, that, that somewhere within the framework of art that I would have a voice. Um, I, um, I have my parents, extraordinary mother and father, um, to really thank so much for. Um, my, as I told an audience last night, my mother, <clears throat> part of my moral, part of my moral undercurrent as a child, my mother was saying, I'm eternally gra grateful for my mother and father and that's her, my grandparents, mm -hmm. because I didn't pick cotton in September. I went to school in September. Really? So there's a paradigm shift there. It's a real extraordinary shift. So I'm, I'm sitting on this stage because my mother didn't pick cotton in September. And she was, she was quite, as, as a friend of mine called Lumley would say, he knew my mother. She was a force of nature. She was just extraordinary. You had to battle with her. <laughs> she was just too in extraordinary. But she was and, supportive of you becoming an actor? Huh? No, not so. <laughs> <laughs> I had to act out with her sometimes. <laughs> but we loved each other. We were in love with each other. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm the firstborn, and that's my first love, you know, my mom, you know, and, and I'm my mother, I am my mother's son, you know, opinionated, self righteous. And, and we know everything. <laughs> so so we, you can see the way we used to lovingly clash, you know. So take me back to that point where you became a professional actor. What was your breakthrough moment for you? Well, there, there were several things that, that, that happened. Um, at first, I, at first, I had never been on stage before, before I was 20 years old. And we had invited Amiri Baraka who was a leading voice around black art in the, in the spring of 1967 out to San Francisco State College to start what he called a community communication project. And that's this is very interesting because now you're situating art within the framework of ex exploring ideas in which you can convey ideas, or messages of, you know, to, to, to communities, to people. And I remember him coming in, I teased him, I used to tease him about it. Remember me coming in into the BSU office, the Black Student Union office. He says, I want some of you so-called revolutionary, uh, 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 revolutionaries to come and be in these plays. And you know, Mary is about that tall. So all of us, <laughs> you know, but he had, he spoke like he was about seven feet tall. And so what happened was, I went to a play, it was Dorothy Ahmad, a, a playwright, a young playwright from San Francisco, local playwright. The playwright said that, that everyone wanted to be in their plays who came, it was Baracus, Mad Heart, uh, Ed Bullen's uh, How Do You Do, uh, Ben Caldwell's First Militant Preacher, um, and um, Jimmy Garrett's We Own the Night. Those are the four plays. I was in the, the play that was most known about. So I went to the place where I could audition and not get noticed or not anybody, nobody compete with anybody. And I was the only one in audition as I mumbled and bumbled, which I continue to do over my, through my audition. And it began there. And I, and I remember the first performance, you know, uh, on, on a small stage. And if something was happening, I think it was the evolution of the process, it's myself engaged in a process that was liberating in some ways, and, and I, I'd use that in a general term, and I, not in a sense when I said liberating, it, it kind of like, this is a space I had never been in before, and it was new to me, 
And, and so, and, and I probably, you know, as you look at the, the meter in terms of the performances, I probably did pretty well in the performance. Yeah, I think you probably did. But uh, somebody else saw that, it was called Papa's Daughter, and I was like 20 years old playing the father of a, a teenage daughter, you know what I'm saying? So, so that's, that's a signal where my career is going because I'm always playing someone older than I am, you know? You were too young to watch it then, clearly. Yeah. Um, can, so it began there. It, be, that it was began the, there. Yeah. I'm, it's always interesting with actors who have a strong stage career because often it feels like that's where you can get the meatiest roles relatively young. Yeah. And I'm thinking ahead to 1979, An Escape from Alcatraz, which is kind of, the, is that your first film role as opposed to? Well, Escape from Alcatraz role? was really my first film role. But I think the, the, key, the key to point to me <clears throat> with acting, because I left, left it all together. I finished, I majored in economics. I worked in city government for six and a half years uh, for the Office of Community Development and the Model Cities Program. And it was an extraordinary, because I think it was a form uh, right in the in the early 70s, I came in 1971, form of what I call what I call grassroots uh, organic intellectual organizing and democracy. So why leave that world after? Uh, well, to it, go in some, some sense, I, it, you you wander into something else, and, and then you you wander back to something, and there's something else that happens there, and I'm a pragmatist in a lot of ways. You know? I'm, I'm glad you said that because I was watching back clips of um, Escape from Alcatraz, which if you haven't seen it, it's Don Siegel, it's Clint Eastwood, um, you're an inmate in it. And I wonder what it was like for an actor like yourself um, working in film at that time, where it, can, it did look in some ways like roles for people of color, could seem quite limited. Were you very pragmatic about taking roles in prominent well, films it, it, with a long-term strategy? It's, it's funny, it's funny because the the casting director was Marion Doherty, and she had seen Carl Lumley and I in a play in 1978 at the Matrix Theater in LA, a new theater, a small theater, The Island, at the Fugard's The Island. And she hired both of us as to be part of that. She had come to the small theater. We were only doing three performances a week. And she came to that. Marion Doherty later was the one who came and when they started casting Lead the Weapon, and they said, what about for the role of Murtaugh? She said, what about Danny Glover? And, and Dick Donner said, but he's black. And she stood up and looked at him in the face, yeah, he's black, so what? <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to talk about. We and Marion Doherty had seen me in that play that in 1978, and, and like she had seen so many people. She had casted everyone from De Niro in their first stuff to Pacino to Hoffman to Meryl Street and all that. She said, she, she was the one that said, boom. So it's funny. And it's also interesting because from the beginning, your prominent roles, they're a real mix of playing people who are good and people who are bad. And I was thinking of Witness, where um, the Harrison Ford film, where you're the corrupt cop who carries mm -hmm. out that murder. You know, it's mm -hmm. the kind of seminal scene. And yet then, you know, within a couple of years, you're doing Lethal Weapon. I wanted to show um, a clip now of the Color Purple, which is uh, the 1985 film based on the award-winning Alice Walker novel. Um, you play the brutal wife beater who's married Seeley but really wanted her sister. And the clip I've chosen, I think, it's, I'm struck by how much is going on in this performance, um, finding his, his weakness in a way. And this is um, the first time we see the adult Seeley played by Whoopi Goldberg, who's mm -hmm. been married to you for a number of years. Let's mm -hmm. show the clip. And, what I really love about that, um, watching your performance again, is it's uncompromising on the violence, and yet, as we see in that sequence, there's real humanity you bring out of him. You show his weakness, and the physical comedy on the stairs when you slip. Yeah. I wondered when you took on that role, whether you felt, I have to find a way to show more to this man than just the violence. Well, first of all, every, every character has his arc. And as I've always said about The Color Purple, that <clears throat> the transformation that Seeley was going through, eventually go through, Mr. himself was going through his own transformation. And so as what you see is, is all of those who the actors out there, you're often choreographing at certain of the moments that you choreograph. Even the ambivalence around the violence was, was a part of how I saw Mr. in his transformation. Now, I'm not, I'm not, when, I, when I think about there, 
the act of acting is the act of being. So I'm not, I would, my attempt was not to, to demonstrate who Mr. was, it was to be Mr. Yeah. And all those elements of that, uh, elements of Mr. set up, I think, the stage for his own transformation and his own self-realization as well. We were talking backstage about how when, in the mid-1980s when I was at university, all these amazing novels by African-American women were right. really starting to get studied in universities here as much as they had been in America. Yeah. It was a very exciting time. Um, and you said you, you found it fascinating reading them because of the way they wrote about men. Oh, I'm particularly, t I mean, all of them. T Toni Morrison, I've read everything. Every Tar Baby, Sula, you can go on and on. All of, all of Toni Morrison's early scenes because I, I was excited about what they had to say. <clears throat> if there's not no, any process of self-analysis, of listening in some sort of way, how do you grow? You know, how do you understand yourself? And there's always been the process of reading. I think that women, particularly black women, understand me more than I understand myself sometimes. <laughs> you know? but also and, and, and that was a process, and that was something that I think where it was, where it was intuitively something, something about my mother, because she was just, I come from a very strong matriarchal line. You see it, my grandmother, my mother, you see it all the way through, you know. And my, my, grand, my, 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 my mother was a calmer side of my, my grandmother. But you know at the same time that they were, um, they, they had such, such beauty and, and such, at the same time, my dad would say, my mother would say, Care. he said, Jimmy, go with them, <laughs> go with them kids. Let's see what they think My dad, I don't feel like spanking them kids. Well, I'm gonna spank them. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she was on his own. She, she was, you had to. She had four boys, you know, and one girl in my family. And so on the one hand, on the one hand, she was, she was the force. I mean, she was the, she had vision. She was a visionary, my mom. And, 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 and all that, and I've learned that, that the, the, the process of being, I think, being in such, and being, my father was the most comfortable, my father was the most beautiful man I ever met in my life. You, you know? speak from such a position of confidence and security, and what's interesting is that you'll know, people sometimes look at films and they think, what kind of black man do we see on screen? Yeah. And there is sometimes an anxiety that we see black men portrayed you know, as wife beaters. Yeah. You don't seem to have had any anxiety. You take on a role because it's a good role. But because it's a good role, a, a, a good story within the role. It's a, it's a good yeah. story. If we look at the color purple as, as some, something that it, as something demonizing black men, then we miss, miss the point of it. It's about the process of evolution and everything else. And my, my, it's so ironic that my grandmother who was born in 1895 was the same age that Seeley was, 14 years old in 1909 with the Let's Count, you know. Now, my, my grandmother saw the movie and she came out of the movie Hopping Mad. She said, really? I'm going to get a switch after that boy. He know he was raised better than to act like that. <laughs> and, then we'll come, and so every time, my grandmother lived to be 99 years old. Every time I come to the, and I've, I had such a close relationship with my mother's side of that family in rural, real rural Georgia. And, and I still go down there. I was down there last week. And so I had, every time I come in, she would be in a wheelchair. She said, don't come in, don't come in there without a switch. And she, and that, and she could just say to me, she hadn't seen me for a long time. And she said, don't run. And she would say, I'm a, if you don't run, I'll, you run, I'll catch you and everything. <laughs> that, was, that was asserting her own, in her own way her authority. Yeah. You know, and you knew, you know, is, uh, um, that she was, she was the, the matriarch, not only of that, that, that household, but the matriarch of the community as well. I want to move on a couple of years. And it's clear that you'd had quite a lot of prominent roles. And often you were playing kind of cops, whether good or bad. So when Lethal Weapon came calling, you were calm, you were ready. Um, and the premise for anyone who hasn't seen Lethal Weapon. <laughs> Oh, a couple of people. Um, <laughs> I remember seeing it at the cinema, and it's still one of those films that you never forget seeing it in the cinema. But the premise is good cop, mad cop. And um, it is hard to explain the impact of the film, but it's so uh, kind of full of excess. And the clip, let's have a look excess. at the clip first. <laughs> Your partner Riggs, played by Mel Gibson, has just got a potential suicide off a rooftop by handcuffing himself to the man and jumping off. Let's have a look. <laughs> I have, I have to ask, you know, that film looks so 
I wouldn't say coke tart, but I'm sure it wasn't. You're the calmest thing in it. And I, and I just wonder, how did you approach that film? Did you know it was going to be such a big thing in every sense of the word? Um. <clears throat> <laughs> I know, I need, we need time, time to calm down even after two minutes of that. Film. It's so excessive. I, um, I think I had um, certain advantages within the industry. There had been another acceptance within the characterization of black men, and, and that was brought on by so many cha changes within the film industry itself, um, most notably within television, when you saw the Huxables, and, and you had a whole other image that people were lawyers, professionals, had families and everything else. So when I, when I approached that, and since I thought about the, the, the kind of new images that are present there, and, and I think that, that that was the place where I, I found most c comfortable in that, you know. Well, you and I had a, I have a daughter, and I have a very close relationship with my daughter, uh, and I was a fa I'm a father, and uh, not, not unlike my father, it's the most important thing that has happened to me in my life being a father, and so all those things I was able, able to weave into the character. Because from the beginning, the big from contrast the, from the we beginning. see you as that family it, it, man. Saying, so whatever yeah. way in which, in which Murtaugh is allowed to go off, given his position, because he lives, he, he, he has a very dangerous job, a very dangerous profession. So whatever the way he was able to do that, and plus I think something else, uh, the, the, the other part of the, the series, of which were four, was they always had something that was much larger than just being a cop. You know, whether it's the, that one, I think the first one dealt with, with the, the drugs. Yeah. Is, the second one dealt with apartheid. That's right. What's happening, it was, in fact, it was banned in South Africa. They wouldn't show the film in South Africa. It was Joss Ackland as the villain, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The third one deal, dealt with guns in the community, and the fourth one dealt with immigration, illegal immigration. So all those kind of thing, things position, situated the film in a way in which you, you, you had more, more of, of who, what, and is our own humanity was able to kind of find its way and find its way within to the, in the narrative. Well, you particularly would see that, but certainly the impact of them as a blockbuster was partly about the, you know, the, the, the bigness of the violence and the madness, and certainly, I mean, that scene, it's interesting because you're absolutely having to lose your rag and be almost as mad as Mel Gibson is throughout the first films. And yeah. I wondered if it was hard for you to dial yourself up to that kind of outpouring because that's not the kind of actor you are. You're, you know, you're a much more subtle well, actor. Well, I, I, I think <laughs> Did I, you enjoy I, I, it? Well, I think I, I learned, <laughs> I've learned so much. You know, you learn so much about all parts of yourself as an artist, as an actor, you know, so I, I didn't find it hard within the framework of the, of the character itself, that was the place where I had to go. That's not to say that my own behavior as Danny is not absent from that. I can go crazy too. I can go off too, you know, and, and, um, and probably when I was younger, I was more, I, 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 I was unable to, con unable to control the very swings of temperament when I was much younger. You know, okay, see, yeah, there were things that we can talk about. <laughs> am, I, am I allowed to say also, it's really weird watching Mel Gibson act mad in mm. that, because, you know, down the line, he's done some slightly um, unusual things. And, uh -huh. um, and I, I don't know what, I mean, at that, that time, he was an up-and-coming star, relatively unknown. You had been a steady working known actor. Did you notice anything? I mean, I, I say it, one wonders where that performance of his was coming from. A lot of it is on the kind of big eyes. Um, was there a sense of different styles as actors? No, it wasn't. I, you know, I, I worked, watched uh, Mel's work over, over the years. You know, I was fascinated with his work in Gallipoli, you know, yeah. and fascinated with some of his other work, you know. In fact, we had, it's ironic, we were at the, the Venice Film Festival in 1985, 
and I had just finished Color Purple, shooting the Color Purple, and I was on the, on the tour for Silverado, which was at the Venice oh, yeah, Film the Festival. Western and then we had, we had this, this opportunity to cross each other's path and everything else, and I talked about how much I loved his work, really loved his work, and watching his work, Mad Max and all that stuff, and, and they said it'd be great, it's 1985, great to work together sometime. So with no idea what this was on, on the on, on, was as part of our reality, you know, and part of our, our story, our narrative. But I, I just found that that working with Mel is an extraordinary generosity yes. as an actor. You know what I'm saying? And probably I felt in, in in terms of just where he was in his career and I was, I was I felt a lot more intimidated within that process really? in the process. And, and it's, it's sometimes it's good. I think it's a part of my, my, my own persona and everything else. Because on the, on the one hand, I always consider myself to come to the back door, the back door of this profession. You know, that my, my dreams in my early years were not to be an actor, you know, and everything else. Not because I didn't, in some sense, embrace or love that. I just didn't think that I had the capacity to do that at all, you know, and and the find the final ways to find that that within whether it's uh, Zach in the Blood Knot, you know, or the, or a Seasway and Seasway Bonzi is dead, or 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 in the island that I found I found and within the characters my platform and my space within that in the sense. And, in, and I would say in the sense that it was also an, an attempt to explore my own humanity as well. Okay. And so all of that. So I think if, I'm, I'm always trying to find, even in, in films that, that don't openly display it, I'm trying to find some sort of meaning within that, some sort of larger meaning just that the, the, what's the, the role itself or the film itself. Because I think that, that it, what has been, but I've been successful in terms of my life, in terms of that, thinking of feeling that whatever I'm doing is much larger than me. If whether I was a student and we were on strike, it was much larger than me. Whether I was an actor when Mary Baraka, never been an actor, Mary Baraka, I want some of your so-called revolutionary brothers to come in here and be in, <laughs> be in these plays. All that has been the temperament that I think has, has been essentially the modus operandi for me in, my, in approaching my work. And also that word you used early on about being pragmatic, because the money you would have made from the Lethal Weapon series, you obviously then had the potential to put into things you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and the next film I wanted to look at is um, To Sleep With Anger, which some of you may have seen mm -hmm. last night. 1990, a fascinating film about a kind of old friend, a trickster, who um, worms his way back into an affluent LA family. Mm -hmm. You won the Independent Spirit Award um, for lead actor for this. and. Um, you're like an old friend who's come back and here I think the, the grandparents have gone to church and you're at home with um, a couple of the, the adult children uh, telling a story. Let's have a look. Um, I love the way that it's, it's both modern of its time and yet there's this fairy tale like sense of you know the, the, the mysterious character who walks in. Um, what did you feel in taking on that role? What did you draw on? When you Oof. when you try to be this person, wow. And I had <clears throat> so many things, you know. Um, you know, I, I knew about even though I was born and raised in San Francisco, and grew up in the Haight Ashbury and everything else. I knew about Toby's, and there was somewhere because of my mom and the relationship I had with the very rural South, you know, when you don't talk about some of the things that really happened, you know. And because of that relationship, I, I drew on a, a great deal of that in that sense. Not that I'd ever met anybody like, like uh, um, uh, the character here. I can't think of his name right now. Help me out. Help me. You know. Um, but but there, but but I I had 
I, there, there were things that I drew on, and then the script, the work, the writing was so wonderful. The writing, which, which Charles put together, was so engaging and everything but else. But not even the, just the dialogue. There's a scene not long before that bit where, you know, you're left in the house on your own for the first time and you're going around opening all the drawers, looking at all the photos. Yeah. And it's so effective and the way you do it just, mm. just yeah. already getting power over the family. Well, it's, 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 th that's, that's my objective right there, you know. And I, I've been, I've, I've lived in situations, I've been in situations where, where people have an extraordinary extraordinary number, amount of power within the situation. And you're always, um, uh, you're always in, in the sense that you're, you're on edge. Or they, they're able to turn something into, into, into something that is really, in, in a sense, I'm trying to find the word, but really not quite demonic. But, and, That's and a very that good was, word. Because that was, you're on that cusp yeah. between being a complete charmer and being something quite demonic. And, and there's something quite Mephistophelian, isn't there, about the idea of the, the cunning yeah. I mean, of I mean, those, those, those people are in within all, all different kinds of fairy tales and, and stories and community stories where they come somewhere and all of a sudden something has happened to that village once they leave, or it's happening to that town in which they leave, you know. And... You know, I, I've been, uh, in, in some sense, in, in situations on, on both sides where there's a relationship and something was wrong with the relationship. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, this ain't me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know. And there's something deeper than that. And, and it's been frightening, you know? And, uh, and you, you channel that because there's a clip which we haven't got. I'm going to show a different clip of Beloved. But there's... Um, Oh, no, actually, it's a sequence from The Colour Purple, which I ended up not using, when you're trying to seduce um, Celie's sister and you're riding on horseback, and yeah. you're smiling at her through the trees, yeah. and you lift your hat and the pe rose petals fall out of it, yeah. and then suddenly you turn into someone far exactly. more aggressive. Exactly. But the camera is... So often I notice the camera is on your face and this amazing, charming smile that holds you both charmingly and yet has that threat in it. Are you conscious that that's a skill you have, or is that just something that you just do? <laughs> oh man, I got the look! <laughs> I, t <laughs> I, I tell you, I did not say that, 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 that women, black women, have such a, an extraordinary way of knowing us and everything else. <laughs> Oh, but so you just—it's just you can just. Well, I'm, 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 I'm working it. on. I, you're always. You're you're, in the midst of finding things, and I don't know how much of that, how, because one of the, the space, whether it's the color purple, whether it's Charles Burnett and the Sleep of Anger, Harry is the character's name. Whether it's the space that you're allowed. To create and to be. You know, um, um, for instance, I had a role in Switchback when I was a serial killer. I read everything that I needed to see about serial killers. There's a whole section of the FBI that really just study serial killers. And so I read every single thing. And, 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 and worst thing is that they're a sociopath, but they're the most charming people you'd ever want to meet. So it was so happens that I was in Denver. This is 1995. And I had just began to find, um, get into something called Pilates. Very few men were doing Pilates. This is not what I expected you to say when you started <laughs> talking about serial killers. But go for it. And so, and so I started taking Pilates. Okay. And Pilates is, 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 is right here in the cheek. Right here. And... I did, what I did with this, and I'll, I'll say this now, this is it, but I used my thing, I took Pilates like four times a week. And, 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 and my body just transformed just with Pilates. So I said, this is where I want to go and everything else. And then I would play in my, my trailer every, every single, over and over repeatedly, John Coltrane's 
equinox. And, 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 and I said, this is how I want to move. So sometimes you physicalize something be, while you internalizing and finding, physicalizing the bo body, training the body in some sort, using the body as the vehicle in order to internalize the things that you want to do. You see, you, make, you, you turn a, a, an answer of a film that's actually about serial killing into something really intriguing and charming and cu culturally rich. And, and I, I just wonder what your relationship is with some of these films. Like you did Saw, which was a very low-budget um, yeah. horror film, the first one. And, um, of course, it turned out to be the best. But they're often films of incredible violence. And I'm interested in how you deal with them as an actor because I somehow... I sometimes tend to think of horror films as being in, intrinsically not about good acting, and yet your presence completely confounds that. Often you're the thing that, you know, makes you want to watch a film which might otherwise be unbearable. Man, I, I haven't seen Saw, but, but I, I, because I don't, I'm, you don't horror like films scare film. me. <laughs> Watching them scares me always. <laughs> I'll make them, but I don't, I don't watch them. <laughs> but on the, on the one, on one hand, it was, it, it, it was behind, the idea that the writer, a young 22-year-old Asian from Australia, had around it. And I bought into it. I bought into the violence in it and everything else. So I was able to find my, my world. So the combination, the character is not any specific character that I'd done before and any other particular relationship that I'd had with the narrative within, within the story and itself. But this was new to me, so it was challenging to me in a sense. I love that you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um, there, there were some interesting films being made um, through the 1990s around race. Um, and films around the slave experience are always difficult, I think. The film of Toni Morrison's um, Pulitzer Prize winning um, novel, Beloved, was especially ambitious, given that there was a whole kind of magical realist mm. aspect to it. And it's about a woman haunted by the fact that she killed her slave children rather than let them be recaptured. Um, and she seems to be, yeah, she's being haunted by the spirit of one of them. You're her former lover and a loyal friend. I mean, in incredibly important character um, who finds her again years after the kind of traumatic events of the past. Um, let's have a look at a clip. Again, it's fascinating how often you are the moral calm for us, for the audience, through a, a film that has some very harrowing imagery. And you'll know, you know, critically, it had quite a difficult reception. It was a difficult novel to film. What was your feeling about how well it worked? And indeed, why you wanted to do it? It's so harrowing. It is the most important film that I've done. Oh. And I say that unequivocally. When we're, which we're faced with, in all of our actions, mine, and I understand that part of my psychic and historic memory is slavery. Whether, wherever I go, if I'm in the South, my direct, it wasn't a direct experience that for me, of course, but it becomes part of my psychic memory. And part of the healing process is dealing with the issue of slavery. Part of my country's healing process, whenever, if it ever gets to it, is dealing with what slavery was and what it did to these human beings. And I think, I thought these men and women who came out of this horror, the most courageous people I ever met, they were courageous. Because they began, they began from from a point where, where their existence had no meaning at all to those outside, to finding themselves. This is about the, this beloved is about finding the self. What does it mean to find the self? A baby finds itself when he says no for the first time. Yeah. A baby finds self no when he says mm. This was about that. It's the most important journey that I had. I had a room called my beloved room. It's in my library in my house. And I had pictures around the wall, pictures, books open, photograph. Because something in the photographs and something in the photographs not only demonstrated the extraordinary capacity, the extraordinary will, and extraordinary courage 
for these men and women to come out of this and reveal something about. Baby Suggs talks about we all got ghosts hanging in our rafters, fear, anger, guilt, all of those hanging in our rafters. And we're all part of that, you know? Just as, as Jewish people remember the Holocaust, they also remember the Spanish Inquisition. You know, before that, so it becomes a part of that and then accepting that and understanding that. And the journey for me for that, that rope was that, to find it. I stay in my beloved room. From one time I walk in it in the middle of the night, three in the morning, something like that, working on this film, and I start crying uncontrollably. And I have to get out. And then sometimes I go in there in the place that, the place I, in the sense that I conveyed in my mind, put in my mind, was a positive of all those spirits, all those things, all the little things. I remember from being with my, around my grandparents. All the little things that I remember, I remember meeting or remembering the image of my great grandmother, my grandfather's, my grandfather's mother, my maternal grandfather's mother, who was born in 1853. She was freed by the emancipation. I remember her. I remember the images of her when I was down there as a child. And a great deal of, a great deal of my senses with the smell, taste, find their way in that, in those, in that moment, you know, because when I was born 70 years ago, not too much had changed <laughs> in the South, relatively speaking. You know, relatively speaking. So all those were the kind of tools, but it, it was the most it, it, extraordinary journey for me. That's an amazing story. Um, I actually want to play a clip which is quite contrasting now. Um, in recent years, um, you've taken some very interesting supporting roles. And one was in the film of Dream Girls as the music manager who finds a younger man is taking over his star. And, you know, again, it's based on a history, but it's a history which is both celebratory and mm. yet also honest about racism. Let's have a look. At, this is from 2006. It's, it's such a beautiful, <laughs> fun film. But it's also, there's so much amazing talent. Was it fun to be part of? Oh, absolutely, you know. It just absolutely, it was, uh, is really, 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 really special. You know, and, and for me, you know, to play that role, you know, I mean, it was really, I think there was something about, it, we, we have these images of ourselves <laughs> that we, we can only play with in our minds, you know, in, in, our, in our dreams, or sometime we're in the shower or something like that, or getting dressed and everything else. And it's always someone in my mind, like, this character I wanted to play. You know what I'm saying? It's always about, about um, it's about music, it's about so much about them. It's in, in like, like for instance, my, I told you my father was the most beautiful man I ever met. He was also the coolest cat I ever met, my dad. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was so cool. And so when, when our relationship particularly after my mom passed. Our relationship, we'd always, he, he, I called him up and said, what's happening, baby? He, he said, I, I was all right, and we'd say, we only call each other buddy, baby, or partner. That's when we call me, that's the only reference if one thing was going on. And he was an impeccable dresser. My dad was eating, clean as cat. He was an impeccable dresser. And he would always tell us as a kid, hey man, and this, this is extraordinary, extraordinary kind of like union that these two people make. And they say, hey man, I know what you guys are doing out on the street, because I did it. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was to be able to, and my dad, I'm 6'3", my dad was 5'4", innocent, <laughs> innocent. And it was, but he was a giant to me. So it was always, it was always, as I was saying, let's say on the stage, my, my mother was, uh, today when I say, my mom was like, hey, my, I don't feel like whipping up kids. <laughs> mean, so like, you kind but, of drew on that. And so, it, 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 but, and, and a lot of that, and I just realized that, that, that in some sort of ways, I'm channeling, we're always channeling somebody. Sometimes in places in the heart, I'm channeling my grandfather. In the film I did with Diego Luna, it was about a pig farmer. I'm channeling Mr. My, Pig, which I was Mr. going to talk Pig. about. If you haven't seen it, it's just beautiful. It, it, you know what I'm saying? I'm channeling, I'm, channeling, I'm channeling my grandfather. Again, he was a pig farmer. You know what I mean? 
and everything else. And I, and I remember all the things that how we got his pig sick. That's something about feeding him, feeding him, eating the hearts out of the watermelon, and then throwing the throwing the throwing the mix. The, the watermelon wine and the rest of the watermelon they want to the pig. And it's my dad, was, and my grandfather, he got pissed off. He said, Carrie, you come on and get the kid. I done got my hogs all sick, feeding them all that dog on water. You don't get them. I'm not going to get them. You don't get them. That's what he used to tell me. We should say so those, are things, those are the things that, that cared to us. But my dad was that right there. And I thought about that in the sense that, hey, man, I'm out of here. You know what I'm saying? Well, there's this sense of um, you've seen it all before and of, of kind of knowing that things are moving on. And yeah. I think as, as you've got older, what's interesting is how you have drawn on your, your father your, and your grandfather to I mean, portray yeah, yeah. that sense of the, the older man. Well, who's well, had well in, in, in since when I did Places in the Heart, the working Places in the Heart was dedicated to my mother, who died in an automobile accident on the very day that they told me I got the role. She was on her way home to Georgia to see her mom and daddy. And, and so I had, I had, I knew that with places in the heart, when I read the script, my mother was like this, she would go read her tarot cards. She'd get her tarot cards read and everything else. It's beautiful. So she told me in April of two, uh, 83. I need to turn a little bit. You, you the told mind. me in April. No, I'm sorry, back. can everybody hear me? Yeah, just sit. Okay. Sit back a little, but just she, face she, back she, had, to, she had told me in April in, 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 in 1983, you're going to do a role in September that's about you. She's going to have a tarot card read, saying what's going to happen here, what's happening. Then she'll be at church on Sunday. Friday, she'll be up in, 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 in uh, uh, Reno at the slot machines. <laughs> that's my mom, man. <laughs> my girl, man. <laughs> Is she running around there? Jimmy, where my wig at? I don't be, Carrie, I don't know where your wig at. Well, I didn't have your wig, but find it for me. <laughs> this is before she had to go to church. It's so beautiful. It's like, that's what I come out of. You know what I'm saying? And it, it was so vibrant in, in, in everybody else. And, but there was, there was so much love. It was, just, it was seven of us. There was so much love, you know. And it's amazing how that transferred. And, and you knew that you were loved. In my family, you knew that you didn't. You knew. You knew. That, I knew that my dad. When I fell in love with my dad, I was about five years old. I fell in love with him. I thought he was the most. He was the coolest cat. Do you know you have to write a manual on parenting. Oh. You know, I just think. <laughs> I just think on on being a good dad. And the lessons you learn. Um, but I'm also struck by someone who's obviously had a really positive upbringing. That you've always had this passion yeah. for campaigning. Um, and that's been from the very beginning of seeing where things are not right and wanting to change things. And one thing that you founded was a Louverture Films, which uh, Ashley mentioned, mm -hmm. which focuses on historical relevance and social purpose. Mm -hmm. And you've, I, I don't know if that production company was involved in things like the disappearance of McKinley Nolan, a film about an African-American soldier who went AWOL in Vietnam. But obviously taking on real historical subjects, yeah. um, that were stories that weren't being told. Why, why did you want to do that? I think in this business, there, there are two things that happen. The business is going to give you and present to you an opportunity for a few of us of the things they want you to do or the things that they have available for you to do. The question is always, what do you, what do you want to do? What are the things that you want to do? And I, and I tell people, I'm not, I'm not an actor if it had not been a thoughtful guard. And the plays that I did, I used to dedicate in 1976, 1978, I dedicated a book, a, a performance to Ernest Cole, who wrote House, the pho photographs from House to Bondage, the first real photographs that came out of South Africa and what this system was like. Or I dedicate in 1970 a performance to Mandela a performance to a homeless man and everything else. Everything was to elevate that, but I'm not a, 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 an actor. And so Louverture Films, with my extraordinary, extraordinary, brilliant co-producing partner um, in the film, uh, 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 Jocelyn Barnes, provided me with an opportunity to do some of the work that I wanted, that I envisioned, that was some work that I thought. And she was so, she's so amazing in what she, she would bring to me 
and to do. And I said, I would buy into it. So she's always expanded my whole idea of what film is possible, whether it's black power mixtape, or whether it's concerning violence, or whether it's uh, Trouble the Water on Katrina, you know, or whether it's Bamako that we did with Adiraman Sisako. When we did that, and we met them, he talked about, I want to put the World Bank on the, the IMF on trial in the courtyard I grew up in. <laughs> All those things were fascinating to be able to be, be engaged in that, you know, or even some of the things you, did, you do now um, with Shadow World about illegal global, uh, illegal, illegal arms sales that are happening in the world and the proliferation of arms in the world and to be able, or climate change, this Naomi Klein, this changes everything. All those are things that I've had the opportunity to be involved in because of that because it gives me a sense of that I want this is what I want to do. I'm not going to always get a chance to do what I want to do in front of a camera, you know, but I can facilitate the things that I want to do behind the camera or as a producer. Whether it's films and the idea, I've always wanted to do films in Africa. Mandela was my first thing that I did in Africa in 86, and then others yes, that I've done in Africa. All those things, I always wanted to do that in some way, in some way, was those are the things that, that were nurtured from every point's time. I tell people, when I first heard about the Cuban Revolution, it was 1959, because my mother's and father's union was celebrating the victory of the, uh, uh, the, victory of the Cuban Revolution. And every moment that I said, I wanted to find out more about it. What was it about? What was that? Or when I first, began, when I first picked up an album at 19 years old by Marion McCaber, and Carrie Belafonte says that, says this so beautifully. He says, Paul Robeson once told him, get them to sing your song, <coughs> and you're going to want to know who they are. Get them to sing your song, and they're going to want to know who you are. I wanted to know who they were. When we invited Hugh Massacala in 1970 on campus, after, after he had, at, 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 at his first album, we invited him on campus. The more and more, all those, all those are the, condition, the conditions which often which, which are the life it, it, it condition. It's not often being an actor, it's but the, often the other things that you, you're born in, you know? I mean, all the stuff, from first seeing Bob Marley and what Bob Marley transformed, from first seeing Jimi Hendrix and what that did for me and everything, all those things that I've been fortunate enough in my lifetime to be a part of, all of that in some way finds its way, seeps into my work on, at some level. Different level. And you keep the campaigning going because you know I mean I, I was looking at news footage of you just over the last week and you know you've been a prominent um, campaigner for Bernie Sanders and you're out there with unions um, and you know campaigning on 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 issues where you know pay and jobs are being threatened and I'm interested that you, you make the time to do that it isn't even just making films it's actually going out there and being kind of on the line um, as a political campaigner well you know I, I worked in and like I said, I worked in city government for six and a half years. And it was extraordinary what, what people were able to do. And I, I, I'm, I'm born in that moment. What's the, the, the Chinese expression where you always be born in interesting times and live in interesting times? You know, we, we, I, I actually served in the Black Panther Party's Breakfast for Children in 1968. I actually got up in the morning and went to the went went to St. Anne's Church and served children in the Breakfast of Children program. I had political education with the Black Panther Party when we were on strike in 1968 and 69 with members of the Black Panther Party. And I saw those young men and young women like me, you know, who were trying to grasp Mao Zedong's The Red Book, you know, <laughs> and what is relevance to it. Or I read Fanon. And over and over and over, I read Wretched of the Earth. I read Nkrumah on, on, on the question of the Congo. I read Early Mandela. I read Amid Caesar. You know, I read all, the, all these works, in a sense. In some sense, in what they prepared me to do, what I do now, that's not the point. The point that I thought it prepared me to do was, first of all, to be a better citizen. To be a better citizen. I remember, citizen, Dimo Khata. A citizen, and that's what is always performing. So all the other stuff is a is a an, a an added part of being what I consider myself. From the first time my third grade teacher, Miss Lumber, said in 19 third grade, so I'm talking about 1955, my third grade said, "I'm not just interested 
in making good students. I'm interested in making good citizens. That's what she said. Here's a woman from deep south, Beaumont, Texas, come to San Francisco, all these kids, most of them black, living in the project, talking about citizenship. That that's, is, that's the bottom line. That's the, the, when you say the, the bottom line, whatever this is manifests itself to, yeah. it was always about that. So if I, if I got on that plane knowing that this extraordinary union, the National Union of Mine Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, young people, 35, younger than 35, the president is 35. The, the general secretary of the union is 45. These are young people trying to shape a new South Africa. That's about citizenship. Yeah. You know? And if I could say something to that, and they can ask me to come down there where I'm twice most of their ages. Is, is that where you've just come from? <laughs> I just come from. Oh, come here. Um, and that's it. It was about that. You know, was I tired? Did my knees hurt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was I tired? Was I dragging around? What's come? Yeah. Was I dragging there? Yeah, until I got on stage and started to speak and, and say what I had to say. And remember encountering that and all that, you know what I'm saying? When I, when I, when I, when I did Mandela, I, I, I was just about to do Lethal Weapon, and I, I flew to the producers, flew to the East Coast, to Connecticut, to see the producers. It says, and I said, they just never, I've done, never done this before in my career. I said, I said to him, you have to wait for me because I'm the only one who's supposed to do this role. And that's what I, I want to say. I've never done, I've never been that kind of audacious, bold, ever been, whatever that. But it's about that. All the work of being in, of being a part of, of the anti-apartheid movement from the early 70s, all the work with being a part of the African Liberation Support Committee from the early 70s, you know, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, you know, uh, Namibia, all those, Zimbabwe, all that part of that is a part of me. Initially, I wanted to do um, um, Spain because of the Moorish Empire. The Moors, the Moors, Moors were in Spain for 700 years, you know, and the impact that it was. And I wanted to go to places that I love. I love like, like uh, I, you know, I love Sevilla and 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 I love uh, uh, Granada, Granada, and every all those places. I wanted to go to places I love, but I actually did had an opportunity to do one of my, I think, the most three important novels wrote, written post colonialism in Africa where things fall apart, Chinua Achebe, uh, Mariana Baas, uh, So Long Letter, and my favorite, one of my, my, my all-time favorite novels, God's Bits of Wood, Usman Sambeni. You read God's Bits of Wood? God's yeah. Bits of Woods. Oh, you know, it's, it's about the 19, for 1947 railway, tra uh, railway strike that went from Bamako to Dakar shut down the whole French empire. It changed the whole nature of the, the struggle for decolonization in French West Africa. And I read that book, and I, 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 wanted, I would love to do a movie about it. And so what I did was, what we did was, we said, why don't we go make that trip from St. Louis, where the first railway tracks were laid in French West Africa, to Dakar. Then we went to take a little trip over to, um, uh, to to uh, uh, Gori Island, then we get on the train, then we go to uh, uh, the seat of the Sudiana Keita uh, Empire, and then we go to Bamako, then we end up in Mufti, with the river Niger, and that which time I read the, the poem, I've known rivers, I've known rivers older than the flow of blood of human veins, like uh, uh, you know, and older than the flow of the human veins, veins my soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates with dawns on them. I built my hut near the Congo when they lulled me to sleep. I raised the pyramids above the, the, above the Nile. And I, I, I went down to Mississippi when Abe Lincoln, I've seen his bloody water. He wrote that at 17 years old. Langston Hughes wrote that poem. So I read that on that. Then we went to the Bandiagara, Bandiagara cliffs where the Dogan people live. And we stayed two days. Three days, three nights with the Dogan people in Bandiagara. It made that trip. Yeah, it was a great railway journey. I know, it's one of the questions. <laughs> you know it's going to come up. You Quick, know, 
There were four wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were real wonderful opportunities and one of very special. And, you know, there was talk about it and talk about it. And um, I would, I, I just don't see it done, because I really am too old for this. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, I, I'm really, I mean, I, mean, I just said it then. <laughs> you know, we're going, the, the, the Academy is honoring uh, Dick Donner, the director, in March. And I know that Dick's, Dick has always wanted to make another. He wants to be his final, his, his, you know, written on his epitaph. You know, I made the fifth belief the weapon and everything else. <laughs> Um, but I just don't think it's going to be done, and it's all right. I'm comfortable with that, you know. And but but um, if say they came up here with a script that we can get together on, yeah. There you go. Uh, we, we were working on a project. Um, it's a wonderful book by Fred Jerome called Einstein's File. And it looks at the FBI's file on Einstein, Albert Einstein. Um, and Einstein, who, who taught at Princeton University and lived adjacent to the African American community. You know, Einstein was extraordinary. In 19, when he, when he was, he had come to Cal Arts to teach every year. And all of a sudden, just as, the, as, as Hitler was coming to power, they procrastinated on giving his visa to come here. It took a public campaign where the State Department was embarrassed, given what was happening in Germany, that got him out of Germany in time for Hitler. But Einstein was a part of the committee, the, uh, the defense committee for the Scarsdale boys. Those were boys accused of race being a girl, a woman in, in the South in, in 19, 1933 and 1934. He was part of that. He was a progressive. You know, Einstein wrote the first in the first monthly review after World War II, wrote the first article on socialism. The first article was on socialism. So there was a relationship between Paul Robeson and Albert Einstein, you know? And I wanted to use that as an angle. We, wanted, we th talked about it, we had bought the rights <laughs> of the book Einstein's File and other subsequent uh, books around, around that. And we tried to get a script done about about the relationship with Robeson and Einstein. They use that as, as a platform um, um, or, or a, 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 a way of getting into Paul Robeson in the moment at a time. And to focus on the period, the period when this man, who was one of the most important African Americans or Africans in the world, in the world, to the point where he's, he's almost forgotten in the US. Mm -hmm. He's almost forgotten until those who had, uh, um, had talked about him, you know. And, 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 and this is all because uh, Paul was one of the first ones to talk about doing a, a film on the Haitian Revolution. Him and the great Which Russian is a project that you're still yeah, trying to get Yeah, what's called, what's called, was the first one. You so, know. so where is this project now then? The well, it's, 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 you know, we, almost, we almost were there in Venezuela, you know. And uh, my, my little brother, Hugo Chavez, president, is my little brother. He's, oh, <laughs> you're my big brother. I mean, you're my little brother right there. And Hugo, man, was the most, man, he was, he was something special. I, know, I don't know any of the, I always get in an audience, you know, I'm in the US, somebody else who, who claims that I stole some money from Venezuela, which I didn't steal any money. I didn't get any money in <laughs> Venezuela. But they always want to attack me on my relationship with, with Chavez and everything else. But he was a real person. He, and the first time I saw, when I met, we met, we were on a delegation to Venezuela in 2003 to meet Chavez. I'm the chairman of, 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 of uh, uh, Chinese Africa Forum. And we're on a delegation, we go there, and we talk about it with Chucho Garcia, who's extraordinary. He was the president of, uh, of the Venezuelan, uh, um, Afro-Venezuelan network. And Chucho, um, we had a meeting with, first thing he talks about in the 1999 Constitution, 
We took care of the issues around indigenous people. We reflected in the Constitution the rights of women, et cetera, et cetera. But we forgot about Afro African descendants. We didn't, think, we didn't do that. Let's take care of it. He said, look at my hair. He pulled off his head. Look at my hair. My grandmother was African. Go. Oh. That's why they called him a monkey and stuff in the news. <laughs> my grandmother's African. But on the one hand, we almost had it done. He said, we owe so much to the Haitian people. We as Venezuelans. We as, we as, as those who are from of Latin America. We owe so much to the Haitian people because when Simon Boulevard went to Andre Pichon in 1813, got money, guns, men, and other things in order to free Latin America. He came back. And, and the, the Haitians, the only thing the Haitians requested is that you abolish slavery. And he came back and he got 5,000 more. We owe so much to the Haitian people. And when we talk about the Haitian Revolution, it resonates whether you're in Cuba or whether you're in the Caribbean, whether it's whether you're in Latin America, you know. But the Haitian Revolution, I would argue, out of the three revolutions that happened within a 25-year period, 15 years, excuse me, 15-year period, American Revolution, 1776, French Revolution, 1789, Haitian Revolution, 1791, that 15-year period. The Haitian Revolution was the most important one. The Haitian Revolution was the most important one. I'm very but, conscious of And so we were, we're try, we've been trying to get that movie done. And that's how I met my producing partner, Jocelyn Barnes. We were shooting a movie with um, uh, Sheikh Umar Sissoko. And just a moment, because we're really close to the end of time, I, I wondered if we could just pin down then and say, what is the status of this now? <laughs> just because I want to get one more question in as well. Will you forgive me? We're going to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, hey, look here, we, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. And, and, and the conversation, the conversation is still happening. The conversation doesn't stop. I've, I've quieted it down. We were just about at the beginning of 2010, beginning to put together the cast. And we had already put together the cast, but we had just got to the point where we couldn't, we couldn't raise the rest of the money. We raised, we had Venezuela and the uh, Villa de Sente, their, their control of the film, which is putting in 60% of the money. That was all going to be spent in Venezuela. Yeah. We're going to shoot that. We could, I could shoot, we could have shot everything within a, 20, a, a 75 mile radius of Caracas, Balavento. You know, where it's an Afro descended community on the ocean. We could have shot things in Caracas and everything. But you're going to have to rethink it outside of Venezuela. We're going to think it outside of Venezuela. Okay. We're going to think it outside. But it's going to get done. You know, and, 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 and Dr. King always said I'm not simply trying to integrate black people into the current system that we live in. I'm about changing the soul of this country. That's my mission, in changing the soul of the country. Does the, does the positioning of black people within the system change the soul of the country? That's a question that we have to ask, particularly now, you know, uh, in this question about this. I mean, when we talk about the soul of the country, we talk about the issue of race, we talk about the issue of materialism, and we talk about the issue of militarism. And I don't see us doing too much about that. About that. We have the, the greatest re refugee crisis since the end of World War II because of conflicts and the, the, uh, the exacerbation of conflicts within internal conflicts in various countries, whether it be Libya, or whether it be Afghanistan, or whether it be Syria, or whether it be Iran, Iraq rather, and that's the reality of it. So I don't know, we have, we have you, you had the most extraordinary moment in Latin America, and many have written about it, from Noam Chomsky, others have written about it, is one of the greatest moments you see all that uh, where left governments that were elected, elected from the bottom up, grassroots organization, real democracy were elected, 
and basically all of them were undermined in some way. Are you there when, when Michelle Obama said the other day she talked about America being now a place that doesn't have hope? Is that kind of where you feel things are? Well, I don't say that. I don't, that's not the, that doesn't mean that hope is not something that is still we've lost. Not at all. I believe that we have this extraordinary. The challenge is this is the moment, perhaps in this moment, we have our greatest challenge and our greatest opportunity at the world at the same time. We have the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity at the same time. And, and what does that mean in the sense? Because we have, we have the real boogie bear in the corner, in the closet for us, and the real boogie bear is global warming and climate change. I think, I think Bishop Tupu, Desmond Tutu said at the, the summit in, in Copenhagen a few years ago, if you allow Africa to go up two degrees Celsius, we'll be incinerated. That's real. We can't, we, and those, those, those are modest, very modest uh, 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 expectations. In conclusion, just because sadly we have, have to finish then. We don't I'm, have to finish. Well, <laughs> Do we? I love your attitude. Now this, this, this is why, this is, this is, and look here, this is why you want to talk about, you don't want to be really drunk about that. You know? <laughs> well, I was going to ask I mean, you to Well, I'm going to say, but, but, but I'm, I'm, tr I'm and, and for, 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 for me, and, 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 and both, you can't, I don't separate uh, or absolve my responsibility as a citizenship by, my, as a citizen because I'm, I'm visible and everything else. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. I'm trying to figure out where are we going to be, where, where are we, where's the conversation? Where's the conversation here? That's what we all to be about. What do we begin to find, build networks and networks internally here and build those and expand those out, out there? Where do, we, where do we find that? What do we find in, in, a, in a movement for labor, for workers, in order to have a union that, that, that says the you are important. Let's work on your behalf. We have to reframe the whole idea in which we look at labor. Do you know what I would say? And I've learned one thing from you. It's that you just keep campaigning. There is always stuff to be done. You, you, you know, he's going to Cuba on a plane at 3.30 tomorrow morning, having just got in from South Africa. You know, but, but that, that, that's what we all have to do. Have to you know, that's what we all have to do. And they say I have to go. She, yeah, she, she's, she's wrapping it up. I feel it? bad. I'm the woman who's telling Danny Glover that but we're not, we we're have not, to go. But, 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 but it's, 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 it's really... No, I know. It's not my choice, but... But the, the, the course of... And whatever I've had the opportunity to do and talk about, it's not what I do. Yet, it's what we do together. Is that very clear? It's what we do together. Whatever the... the, the wherever we make this transformation or make this, it's gonna be what we do together as citizens, not only of our respective countries, but citizens of the world.